I'm, I don't know, I'm really pleased that Low Key has agreed to come on to talk about what's going on in Lebanon because I don't, I don't really understand. There's a lot of things I don't understand about this. I was wondering if Low Key might be able to help me. He, he's put his, he said he, he might be able to. So thank you for agreeing to speak, uh, Low Key. No problem at all. Thank you for having me, Crispin. Uh, now, the, these attacks, these two waves... of attacks on electric electronic devices in in Lebanon last week um what what do you know about what happened i mean there's a lot of speculation about how this was planned what what the kind of detonation was etc what what do you know about this Well, so firstly, what we know is that since October 7th, uh, moves by Hezbollah in the south of Lebanon have forced 100,000 Israelis to be displaced from the settlements they live in, in the north of occupied Palestine. They've been forced into hotels where all form of uh, difficulties are being faced by those people. And that has been really a key pressure point that has been applied on Israel throughout their genocide in Gaza. And what Hezbollah have stated is that they will not um, cease their moves that have forced these 100,000 people um, out of those settlements until the war in Gaza is um, brought to a ceasefire of some form. So uh, Israel obviously has refused that, and has chosen for escalation. But also what happened a couple of weeks ago, which has not been publicly acknowledged by the Israelis, is that Hezbollah successfully, in response to the assassination of Fuad Shukr, who was number two in Hezbollah, um, struck the Unit 8200 uh, base, killing around 22 Israeli military personnel from that very key unit, which um, focuses on... Um, surveillance of electronic messaging. And, and so this was really quite humiliating for the Israelis and actually led to the head of Unit 8200 stepping down about a week afterwards. They blamed it on uh, failures around October 7th, but those who have been following closely and haven't only been relying on what the Israeli military says has happened um, were clear that this, uh, this, uh, this, operation that Hezbollah had launched that had led to these 22 uh, military personnel uh, dying would have definitely been a catalyst for a move like that. So the escalation has been ramping up. In terms of this issue of intervening within the supply chain to plant explosives in uh, communication electronic devices, Israel has a precedent in this. So for example, you have the killing of the PLO representative in Paris in 1972, Mahmoud Hamshari, who was killed by explosives um, installed into his telephone at the house that he stayed at and lived at. And this was part of Golda Meir's Operation uh, God's Wrath. Um, and the telephone was detonated and he was killed. And then you have the case of Yahya Ayash, the uh, nicknamed the Mohandis, uh, Palestinian figure who really prior to more close um, cooperation between Iran and Hamas, which uh, led to Iran really helping Hamas with some of the, uh, the hardware that they were using and the ways to use it, um, Ayash was uh, credited with um, pushing a lot of the new innovations that Hamas was able to um, deal with in the uh, the 90s. And uh, Ayash was assassinated in a similar way, where his mobile phone was smuggled out of Gaza. He used to call his father once a week. And so what the Israelis do in Unit 800 specifically, they study people's patterns. And once a person has an established pattern, there is a vulnerability that can be exploited in some way. And so in the case of Ayash, it was the fact that he would call his father every week on the same day. And so an individual that they were able to convert into a collaborator took the mobile phone that Ayash used, um, gave it to the Israelis. The Israelis stuffed it with explosives, 
uh, he brought the mobile phone back to Ayash. And the first time that they attempted it, it was not successful. So he took the mobile phone again back to the Israelis. They again worked on it. And then the next time that Ayash was to use the phone, it exploded in his hand, um, killing him instantly. And so this is really the application of that model of assassination on an industrial scale. Now, the turning point when Hezbollah went from using phones to pages was really about, you know, four months ago in a very explicit way. Hassan Nasrallah stated in a speech that the reason for the vast majority of assassinations that these factions have faced um, have been the use of mobile phones and particularly smartphones. So if you look at the case of Ismail Haniya, he was uh, using WhatsApp unbelievably um, in the middle of this war. WhatsApp, of course, is a subsidiary of Meta and Meta has all manner of overlaps with uh, the with Israel lobby groups. And even in the case of uh, Mark Zuckerberg, he's actually funded Zaka, which is the Israeli organization which came up with the lie of 50 beheaded babies after October 7th. But there's many other ways in which even WhatsApp, independent from Meta, um, has had a, an interesting relationship with the Israelis. For instance, the founder of WhatsApp was a key funder of Israel lobby groups and even Israel uh, Israeli settler groups. And so this issue of literacy when it comes to communications and technology is a big is a big deal here and so Nasrallah said in a speech about four to five months ago he said the phone in your hand is the biggest spy and the biggest killer that you will ever know so stop using your phones put them away so at that point the pages become uh, ubiquitous and used widely but the question marks here uh, where was Israel able to intervene in the supply chain in order to insert um, explosives within within these pages? And so then there's been a lot of conversations about who were the companies responsible for making the pages and where could these explosives have, have entered the pages? So now initially I was seeing uh, pictures showing that the pages were Motorola pages, um, El Manar, which is a channel, which has clear political affiliations in Lebanon, um, was using images of Motorola pages. So for that reason, I was under the impression that they were perhaps manufactured by Motorola. Now, it's important to make clear that Motorola historically has a far closer relationship with the Israeli military than any other really non-Western, um, sorry, non-Israeli tech company, but perhaps Microsoft is, is closer. But I'm talking about levels of integration with the Israeli military. So when the Israeli military had to um, establish a encrypted network that could not be um, uh, penetrated by resistance factions in the region, they called upon Motorola. And so Motorola worked directly with the Israeli army to establish this mountain rose network, which was encrypted and um, could not be um, surveilled by uh, Palestinian or Lebanese resistance factions. Motorola also were responsible for establishing the wide area surveillance system known as Moto Eagle for the Israeli Ministry of Defense. Now that system is essential to the settlement network and the apartheid wall um, infrastructure and the surveillance around it. Motorola also supplies the Israeli police with the Astro 25 communication system, which allows the Israeli police to communicate with each other. It also provides key components for Israeli arms companies like Raphael and Elbit Systems subsidiary IMI systems. Within the Israeli dungeon system, Motorola is also a key uh, contributor to it. It's even sponsored conferences which have been held by the Israeli ministries of intelligence and defense. So it made sense to me that Motorola may have been involved in some capacity. However, that seems now not to be the case. But what you have is uh, US intelligence sources saying that Israel has been working for 15 years on this um, intervention into the supply chain in order to kind of establish the or, or apply the Ayash assassination on an industrial scale. And, and it's what they've done in the Lebanon uh, context. Now, what seems to be the case is that the pages were manufactured or at least credited to 
Golden Apollo, which is a Taiwan a Taiwanese company. Now that company has a history of supplying the FBI in the United States. And if we were to look at Taiwan's relationship with Israel, especially since um, October 7th, Taiwan donated over half a million dollars to Israel, specifically to assist soldiers um, and fund uh, municipal uh, services as well. We also know that overall, Israel's trade with Taiwan is about 2.6 um, billion, that's of uh, 2022. And Generally, the uh, Taiwan Public Opinion Foundation found that just over 35% of the population post October 7th sided with Israel, while just under 15% of the population sympathized with Palestinians. So there are significant connections there, and there are question marks on this Taiwanese company's role, um, though they have gone to great lengths to try and claim that they've had absolutely nothing to do with this. So what this uh, company, Apollo Gold, did was it pointed at um, a company based in Hungary by the name of Back Consulting KFT, and it claimed that this company was responsible for the manufacturing. However, what's become apparent is that that company does not have any factory through which it could have created these uh, pages. The uh, Apollo Gold has claimed that back consulting um, often would give strange payments that came through the quote unquote Middle East. Now, I've looked a bit further into back consulting and we found that the CEO of it and the only listed employee is Christiana Arcad um, Arcadianco uh, Barsoni who seems to be of a Sicilian background. She describes herself as a strategic advisor in internal affairs with international experience in the Middle East and claims to have studied previously at the School of Oriental and African Studies and uh, London School of Economics universities in London. Now, it certainly would make sense that a, a Hungarian company would be, you know, the argument is that this is a shell company for Israeli intelligence. And that's entirely uh, possible. Hungary has a very close relationship with the Israelis. But then there's also another company which has been pointed out, which is the Bulgarian firm, um, Norta Global Limited. And again, all of these companies are claiming they've had nothing to do with the manufacturing of these pages. They're saying that the pages were not imported to, exported from, or manufactured in their countries. But there has to be somewhere that Israel has stepped into the supply chain. And what seems to be the implication coming from US intelligence sources is that some of these companies are shell companies. What you saw in the second day of this really heinous and hideous terrorist attack that Israel launched on Lebanon was a, a situation where walkie talkies were exploding, the ICOM a Japanese firm, uh, were believed to have produced these walkie-talkies, but then um, it was claimed that the walkie-talkies were discontinued in 2014. So the, the, the question is, um, were these fake walkie-talkies? Did someone else make them? It's very, very difficult. And all of this really points to the uh, infiltration that Israel has launched, not only into tech companies, but into supply chains um, across the last decade or so. I mean, it's a really extraordinarily vindictive uh, method of assassination. Perhaps the only more vindictive way that I've known of Israel to kill people is when looking at the assassinations of Wadi Haddad and Yasser Arafat, when the uh, toothpaste that these men were using were um, poisoned with polonium uh, by the Israelis. And so in the case of Wadi Haddad, he was regularly brushing his teeth and just getting sicker and sicker and sicker until he died. Um, so, you know, Israel certainly is a, a very interesting actor um, and very original and very innovative in methods of hurting people. And what it's doing in Lebanon now, you know, you are seeing people talking about the possibility of Israel using a quote unquote tactical nuke on Lebanon. We obviously don't know that to be the case, but people are saying the bomb um, and the reverberations from it look that way. Um, everyone across the world, even if it's yourself on YouTube, is being sanctioned or punished in some way for supporting the Palestinians. You will certainly say that you have been shadow banned 
on YouTube in an unprecedented way since the uh, launch of Israel's genocide on Gaza. And the ultimate truth is that a price will be exacted um, from those who have stood with the Palestinians. And you have to remember that when it comes to South Lebanon, there have been over 500 people that have died, as they say, on the way to Jerusalem um, in support of the Palestinians in Gaza. So, you know, we are seeing Israel really launch a, a horrific campaign um, on Lebanon, bombing Beirut, um, killing Ibrahim Aqil, the, um, one, of, one of the key figures in the uh, Lebanese resistance movement there. Also, what will come next really is an open question, but I guess one lesson from history, which Israel steadfastly refuses to learn, that greater suppression is always met with greater resistance. You look at even the case of the British killing Azzeddin al-Qassam in uh, 1935. The belief was that if we just get rid of this figurehead, then we will be able to stop Palestinian resistance. Well, what happened? You then had the longest strike in human history carried out by the Palestinians from 1936, um, off the back of the killing and the assassination of Ezzedin al-Qassam. Even to the point that today, the rockets that are fired on the Israelis are named after Ezzedin al-Qassam. So you're not dealing with the population here which has submitted in the face of um, asymmetric uh, military um, uh, equation. Israel has not been able to normalize its imposition of Zionist supremacy on the Middle East through violence on an industrial scale. And yes, across these decades, it has technologically advanced to the point where it's now enacting on the Palestinians a big tech Nakba, um, and it's now able to impose itself on the region in another way. But it doesn't want to attempt to occupy Lebanon. And bear in mind that Hezbollah was founded with the sole intention of driving out the Israeli occupation following the 82 invasion. And in 2006, they were successful in doing that. So Israel has an awareness that it is unable to successfully occupy Lebanon. What it wants to do is to try and get those 100,000 settlers back to the north. Um, but that's the reason why it does these kind of airstrikes, which often kill large, large, large numbers of civilians um, in the cases that we've seen in Lebanon, um, because it cannot engage on a on a hand to hand, street to street level, uh, guerrilla warfare, war of attrition. And think about it. It's spent how long in Gaza? trying to get rid of Hamas. And as far as we understand, it succeeded in killing tens of thousands of civilians and only a few brigades of Hamas. And, you know, at the beginning of the Gaza genocide, the estimation was that there was about uh, 40 to 60,000 fighters of the resistance factions in Gaza. Okay, well, in Lebanon, you have at least 100,000 Hezbollah fighters. What you also have now is Iraqis and Yemeni fighters who are vowing that they are ready to go to Lebanon and fight Israel in the tens, if not hundreds of thousands. What you also have is a one of the reasons why Gaza has been so much um, less difficult for Israel to subjugate is because it's landlocked. It has Egypt on one side and it has Israel on the other side. Um, and, you know, Egypt and Jordan are not going to allow their citizens to go and fight to support Gaza. But when it comes to somewhere like Lebanon, it's not landlocked in the same way. And so there are individuals that have been organizing and fighting in Syria for years that can fight Israel if the opportunity presents itself. So Israel does not want a direct land invasion. And so it will focus on the most hideous forms of warfare like terrorist attacks and airstrikes in order to try and achieve its objectives.